Hey, thanks for checking out this clip from the After Files. We're live almost every Thursday night directly after the episode premieres. So uh, thanks for checking this out and hope to see you live next week. Bye. All right, you guys, you guys take a look at this and then I'll let you go. This okay. was on a, Gina, did you see this today? This, the guy in the plane? I haven't seen this yet. Okay, so for those who don't speak Mandarin, I will read the subtitles. All right, so people screaming on a, on a plane. And the guy says, what are they doing? So there's people just standing up in the aisle going, what happened? Someone opened the security door. You hear him screaming? He says, they are hollow earth inhabitants. This time is his sixth loop. Please open the door for me. People just have their phones out. Excuse me, sorry, sorry. Running up, going to get it. Why are you so afraid? He asked her. Doesn't matter. Police are here. Why are you afraid? So many people are here. Man screaming, the accident is going to happen. Urgently call your family. He said the same disaster will happen as Malaysia Airline MH370. So scared. Cabin crew comfort radio. Tell guests don't be afraid. If you guys are waiting for you guys are waiting for death, life reset. Don't you guys want a life reset? You're slaves. You spend your whole life working for slavery. I ain't effing working for them. These are two different people talking, yelling at each other. Is that I can't really tell. So yeah, so he's in his sixth loop. Oh, look, the plane did not go down, but people were pretty scared. I'd be scared if someone just they're got up and started screaming like that. Yeah, they're trying to keep us off off, off air flights. They're trying. They something's up with airplanes lately, man. Right. At yes. least it's not Americans again. Did you see all those people that like had to be taken to the hospital from that flight in Vegas where they left people on the tarmac for like four or five hours with no AC and and no bathroom and breaks, no bathroom breaks. Yep. Oh, just take me back to the good old days where United would just shame people for their outfits. <laughs> those were the days. Wow. Those were the days, my friend. Yeah. People just just soiling their seats. Yeah. Can't do that. Passing out and bringing medics. It was awful. Well, I'm sure people who judge will take care of it. Don't worry about that. He's going to be fine. <laughs> All right. I'll let you guys go. And we'll see you back here for a Gino story hour. There they go. All right. We're going to do some, we're going to do some weird glitchy stories, stories that I, that I just find interesting and weird. If that's not your thing, then I'll see you. Come back in about an hour. All right. So most of these are from from the Glitch in the Matrix sub on Reddit, which is which is a it, it's a it's definitely a, a fun subreddit to read. Just don't do it alone at night. All right. This this story is called "I Died Last Night, But I'm Still Here." Um, so I'll, and I'll try to, I may have to paraphrase some of these because the language is is not suitable for families or sometimes it's just the stories are kind of clunky and weird and they sometimes they go on too long. So I'm just, I'm just, I will blast through some of those. I died last night, but I'm still here. So this actually happened last week. It just took me some time to come to terms with it. I got a phone call from my next door neighbor late in the evening asking if I can help him move a mattress into his upstairs. His mom is ill and, had a, and has a big, heavy sleep number bed. I, of course, ran over to help because they're great neighbors. I get over there, and his friend, who is also a priest, was there to help. I helped them figure out how to separate the mattress from the bed so we, can, so we can fit it up the stairs. We get it all moved up and back in place when my neighbors asks if I can help them move an armoire upstairs, too. I think nothing of it, and we pull it out of his travel trailer and start bringing it 
up the front stairs of his house. This is where I died. The front stairs are 11 steps. I was on the lower end of the armoire, about six steps up, when my neighbor and his friend lose a handle in the armoire and it comes crashing down on me and I fall backwards toward the pavement. I then wake up in my dining room to my phone ringing and my wife asking me if I'm going to answer the phone. And it's my neighbor asking me if I can help him move a bed upstairs for his mom. So I go over there and meet this priest friend again. And this has been the first time that I met him. I say, I can help you with the bed, but I can't help with the armoire. My neighbor was like, how'd you know about the armoire? I then proceeded to tell him I'm pretty sure I just died. I spent the next hour talking with the priest. He had so many questions. My neighbor didn't believe it until I described the upstairs bedroom in perfect detail down to the metal mattress frame on the floor and the intricate headboard leaning against the wall. I had never been upstairs in their house before. The priest asked if what I it asked what I saw after I died. I told him I never actually died. Before it happened, I woke up at my dining room table. Uh, TLDR explained my death, but woke up about 20 minutes earlier in my life. So there's a few of these stories on there about um, people at the moment of death waking up a few minutes or hours you know, earlier who aren't Tom Cruise. You know, it's it seems to be a common a common story that you see. And we're gonna see a few few of those tonight. This one is creepy. A parallel life awoken by a lamp. My last semester at a certain college, I was assaulted by a football player for walking where he was trying to drive. Note, he was 325 pounds. I was 120 pounds. While unconscious on the ground, I lived a different life. I met a one wonderful young lady. She made my heart skip and my face red. I pursued her for months and dispatched a few jerk boyfriends before I finally won her over. After two years, we got married, and almost immediately, she bore me a daughter. I had a great job and my wife didn't have to work outside of the house. And when my daughter was two, she, my wife, bore me a son. And my son was the joy of my life. I'd walk into his room every morning before I left for work and doted on him and my daughter. One day while sitting on the couch, I noticed that the perspective of the lamp was odd, like inverted. It was still in 3D, but just wrong. It was a square lamp base, red with gold trim on four legs, and had a white square shade. I was transfixed. I couldn't look away from it. I stayed up all night staring at it. The next morning, I didn't go to work. Something was just not right about that lamp. I stopped eating. I left the couch only to use the bathroom at first. Soon I stopped that too, as I wasn't eating or drinking. I stared at the effing lamp for three days before my wife got really worried. She had someone come and try to talk to me, but, but by this time, my cognizance was breaking up and my wife was freaking out. She took the kids to her mother's house just before I had my epiphany. The lamp is not real. The house is not real. My wife, my kids, none of that is real. The last 10 years of my life are not effing real. The lamp started to grow wider and deeper. It was still inverted dimensions. It took up my entire perspective, and all I could see was red. I heard voices, screams, all kinds of weird noises, and I became aware of pain, a shit ton of pain. The first, the first words I said were, I'm missing teeth, and opened my eyes. I was laying on my back on the sidewalk surrounded by people that I didn't know, and lots were freaking out. I was completely confused. At some point, a cop scooped me up, dragged me across the sidewalk and grass, and threw me face down on the back of a cop car, and I was still confused. I was taken to the hospital by the cop, seems he didn't want to wait for the ambulance to arrive, and given CT scans. I went through about three years of horror depression. I was grieving the loss of my wife and children and dealing with the knowledge that they never existed. I was scared that I was going insane as I would cry myself to sleep, hoping I would see her in my dreams. I never have, but sometimes I see my son, usually just a glimpse out of my peripheral vision. He's perpetually five years old, and I can never hear what he says. That one is called The Parallel Life, Woken by a Lamp. It's like a, a plot of some movies, but that's a story that 
that you that you hear is that some people go into comas and they can live or at least in their mind live a long long time and i think the movie inception kind of touched on that a little bit where where in your dreams time moves much much faster so you can experience a lot in a dream i mean we've all had those dreams where uh at least i have we feel like you've you're living hours days weeks and then you wake up and it's like whoa that was weird that felt real this one's called my dad's gut feeling it's a short one some of these are my dad's gut feeling i was 17 at the time and me and my dad had just finished our fishing trip and it was almost midnight, mid-fall. When I was about to get in the car, he told me that he did not want me to sit in the front seat on the ride home. We argued about it for five minutes, and he did not give a good reason uh, to why he did not want me to. I gave up and got, got in the back seat. It was pitch black outside. When we, when we had been driving on the main road for about two minutes, we saw a car driving in our lane. Right as we were about to collide, my dad swerved into the other lane, and so did the car in front of us. I heard my dad say I knew it at the very last second, and then I blacked out. Woke up when police showed up at the scene. They helped me out of the car. I was barely conscious and don't remember much after that. Only thing that is still crystal clear memory is that I saw my dad sitting in the car, waving at me with tears in his eyes. When I later asked where my dad was, I was told that he, had, he would, had, was thrown out of the car window and landed only a few feet from the car and passed away later in the ambulance. I was told the man we crashed with died on impact and also had a 17-year-old daughter in the back seat who survived. I still can't believe this really happened. That was six years ago. Glitches in the Matrix. This is a quick one. This is a short one. I felt myself die in another timeline. My mom and I were on the highway driving home, and there was a semi-truck in the lane next to us. Suddenly, the semi swerved into our lane. Luckily, my mom was able to get out of the way before it hit us, but soon after, I began feeling strangely. The entire right side of my face felt hot and sticky. I tasted blood and smelled the very pungent scent of gasoline. Then my head and right arm started to ache really badly, and I couldn't feel my legs. Just as soon as the pain started to worsen, it went away, replaced with a cold, eerie chill. I told my mom about this, and she couldn't come up with an explanation. I think I was feeling the pain in another timeline, where my mom wasn't able to avoid that semi. I see this story a lot, and, and in the comments, there's a, a lot of people had the similar feelings. Or this one, this person says, I once had an overwhelming amount of grief come over me. It hurt so much, I thought I was having the weirdest panic attack. A few hours later, I found out my friend had just gotten in a bad car accident. He was fine, but his car was totaled. I felt like he didn't make it in another timeline. Never told anyone because I felt ridiculous. So I see that a lot, where people feel like they're dying, uh, they're dead. A loved one is dead, and even though they know intellectually that they're alive, that they're okay, they can't shake the feeling. It just feels too real. You know, there's that concept of quantum immortality, where if you die in one timeline, you're shifted into another for whatever reason. Maybe why that story keeps coming up. And this person thinks they just became the background character for another person's glitch. This technically happened last night, but I was just starting a graveyard shift and I'm only now getting it all down. I work at a gas station chain with only numbers in its name. We're just outside a large chunk of suburbs, none, none, of, none of that middle of nowhere. Like we aren't exactly near any other businesses, but we are rarely completely dead for hours at a time. It was just past midnight, and with everything going on in the U.S. right now, this is COVID, uh, a lot of other things uh, going on right now, a lot of other th other than gas stations and bars are open at night anymore, so, I, so it was a slow evening. 
Look, the, the writing in these isn't perfect. I'll, I'm doing the best I can. I was the only one in the store, and a car pulled up to one of the two double-sided pumps out front. Pretty standard white four-door. I'm not great with car brands, but it was a little nicer, like upper, upper middle class, and probably only a few years old. A, wom a woman gets out and starts walking toward our door like she's in a daze. Legit, this woman looked like she saw a ghost. She wanders up, sort, sort of freezes at the door for a second with a thousand-yard stare before opening it and coming in. She didn't go looking for anything, didn't start shopping, just sort of stood inside for what felt like ages. Again, bars are still open, so I think maybe she's a little drunk or had a rough night or something, so I give the usual welcome to the gas station, let me know if you need any help. She finally notices me and immediately asks me the weirdest damn question I've ever been asked on the job. You can see me, right? Yeah, like what else do you say? She breaks down crying in the middle of my store, so I'm already headed around the corner to see what's up. I have my cell phone out in case I need to call the cops or something for her. I get her to sit down on a nearby pallet of soda, and I'm grabbing her a bottle of water after she catches her breath a little, and she tells me I thought I had died. Again, I'm thinking maybe she's on something, but she's a middle-aged woman who looks like a standard local suburban housewife. We're a pretty boring township without your average junkies like you'd find closer to the cities. So she asks if she can call her husband to pick her up and wait with me. She has her own phone and does so, not really telling him anything either, just where she's at and if he can come get her. He says he'll call an Uber and be there as soon as possible. We're waiting. So far, nobody else showed up. So I'm keeping most of my attention on her. And eventually she starts to explain to me. I was driving home from dinner with my coworkers. And as I'm driving through a nearby intersection, a truck ran a red light and hit me. Now her car is still at the pump without a scratch on it. And she goes on to say she remembers her car being pushed into a pole, going airborne, and then nothing. I tried to calm her down, letting her know that her car is out front and looks fine. But she insisted that she completely blacked out, woke up in an ambulance for a split second, passed out again, then woke up in the driver's seat of her car at the intersection, waiting for the light to change perfectly fine. This whole thing freaked her out so badly that she drove to the nearest, um, nearest anything just so she can get out of the car. Husband eventually showed up to get her. He asked if I had any idea what happened. And even though she sort of explained it to me, I just shrugged because, no, I had no idea what was happening anymore. She reluctantly got into the passenger seat of the car and he drove them back home. That was hours ago, after which I worked an entire shift at the gas station trying to wrap my head around what the absolute hell I had just witnessed. This person says that's quantum immortality. The poor lady, the truck, and the knee ambulance sounds terrible. What happens when you get to the get to old age in the quantum immortality theory is a good question. Natural death results on rebirth from a new mother, but still you in a you universe. You are many ages. When you die, you slide to the closest parallel that matches your own. It's usually only changing something so subtle you rarely, no, rarely notice. Can you elaborate further? A common theme in quantum theory is anything that, that can happen does. When you consider what this means in the context of living and dying, a fatal situation can end with you either alive or dead. If every possible outcome literally does happen, then you will always experience the result where you live. That's true. No matter how ludicrously uh, unlikely, if there's a non-zero chance of surviving, then you always do from your point of view. From your point of view, the world around you does whatever crazy contortions it must to ensure your continued point of view. Quantum immortality gets its name from the idea uh, that it may be impossible to die from your own point of view, no matter how hard you try. That's an interesting way to look at it. All right, that's a near-death experience. We can we can cover that in a minute if you want to. Meeting our son before he was born. So this happened about seven or eight years ago. My husband and I were laying in the bed one night watching television. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a child in the doorway of our bedroom. Thinking it was our only child at the time, I tapped my hubby and said, hey, shh, look, it's, I think Connor is 
going to try and scare us. He turns and looks, and this child walked into our room. I can't explain it because it was one of those moments that seemed somehow different. We watched in silence, soon realizing that this child was not our son. He toddles in, head slightly tilted back, curls bouncing and diapers squish squishing as he goes to the end of our bed. We see his head go down like he was crouching, and, we, and when he got up, when we got up to look, he was gone. I looked at my husband and said, did we just see a ghost? Then almost as an afterthought, I said, well, we know if we have another baby and he has curls, that he was here before he was born. We both laughed because we're not trying for another baby at that time. Fascinated, we go to check on our son and he was fast asleep. Well, a few months later, I'm pregnant, surprise. So fast forward and our new baby Liam is two. He toddles into the room, head tilted slightly back and curls bouncing and it hit me like a bucket of ice water. Holy crap, this is the baby that came to visit us. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt in my mind. Now, on top of that, whenever Liam, Liam is staying the night elsewhere, like with my parents, he comes to visit me in my sleep. For example, one time he came and just smiled at me while I was taking a nap. He was in a little red shirt, and his hair was cut short. The next day, I go to pick the kid, kids up from mom, and lo and behold, his hair is freshly shorn, and he's wearing a little red shirt. I asked my mom, did he wear this yesterday? And she replies, oh, yeah, he did, but insisted he insisted on wearing it today, so he is. So I look at him and say, did you go see Mama yesterday in Mama's dreams? And he looked at me, he was four, all big blue eyes and serious, and nodded his head. If you've got your own glitch story, send them in. A lot of scratch and chills. Yeah, um, all of these pretty much, pretty much hit me in one way or another. Bomb Beastie wants an episode on consciousness. That's a tough one to do. That's a big ask. Streamer services, remote viewing. Yeah, it could be. I mean, it could be an accidental, accidental astral projection. Like Lisa just said, yeah. Bad luck thinks it's Damien. Yeah, I mean, there's a there's a creepy factor to it as well. Apollo Mandos with Reddit. I assume it's all creepy pasta stories. And that's I think it's okay to assume that. I kind of do as well. But remember our motto: I don't have to believe any of the stories. I just like them. This one's he thinks we both died. I'd like to preface, preface this by saying my husband is an electrical engineer and I'm a teacher. We're not crazy people. So back when my husband and I were dating, my husband was in a terrible car crash. His truck hit black ice and he slid into oncoming traffic. His truck was completely totaled. So was the other truck he hit. The weird thing is, though, both he and the other guy were completely fine. Not a scratch on them. All my husband had was a bruise on his knee. The first responders were baffled, as was the towing company and insurance, when they realized no one had died or was severely injured. Fast forward to a few days after the crash. My husband comes over to my apartment. We're having a conversation about a university class we're both in, and he casually asks when I got the flat screen TV sitting in my dresser. Now, at this point, I'm very confused because I've had the little flat screen since I was 13 and had it the entire year and a bit we'd been dating. I asked him what he's talking about. As I've always had that TV, he told me to quit pulling his leg and asked what I did with the old tube TV. I had no idea what he's talking about and told him so. He's convinced I had a tube TV. I proceeded to get on Facebook and showed him a picture we had taken two weeks prior with the TV in the background. It's a flat screen in the picture. My husband goes white like he's seen a ghost and just stares into space for a minute. His eyes started to water and I asked him what's wrong. And he said, I swear to God, I'm not crazy. You've had a tube TV since we started dating. It was a tube TV when we took that picture. I brushed it off as his head being rattled from the accident, and he didn't bring it up again. However, anytime we hung out in my room, he always looked at that TV weird. Well, fast forward seven years. My husband and I have been married for a few and decide that we're ready to be parents. Um, 
I'm not on birth control and we decide whatever happens, happens. She goes into some graphic stuff about <laughs> that pregnancy. Um, but they're in a restaurant. She starts bleeding terribly, but she had recently had a period. So it's not that. They call an ambulance. She goes to the hospital. 20 minutes later, I'm on a stretcher being taken to a hospital. An hour after that, I'm being prepped for emergency surgery. As the doctor tells me, I have a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. I have heavy internal bleeding, and if he doesn't perform surgery, I am going to die. Six hours later, I wake up very sore and tired. Doctor tells me I'm very lucky, and if I had waited any longer to seek medical attention, I'd be dead. Husband stays with me in the, in the hospital the first night, then gets a hotel for the rest of the stay. A week later, we are cleared to fly home, and I go through a grueling month of healing from the surgery. Two months after our return, somehow my husband and I get on the topic of fires, and he goes on about the dangers of kitchen fires, and I say, no need to worry. We're all set with the extinguisher in the closet. And he looks at me like I have three heads and asks me what I'm talking about. I remind him about the extinguisher in the front closet where we keep the coats. We've had it for three years. He insisted we buy one when we bought our house. My husband shakes his head and tells me he has no idea what I'm talking about. We don't have a fire extinguisher. I remind him about not only my memories of fighting about if we really need one, where to put it, buying it from Home Depot, but also installing it to the wall in the closet. He looks at me with confusion and tells me none of that happened. I get up, go to the front closet to show it to him while cursing him for being an asshole for forgetting our two-week fight about it, and lo and behold, no extinguisher. Not only is there no extinguisher, there's no holes in the wall where I know we installed it. No fresh paint. This wall has never been touched. I insist he's moved it and fixed the wall and ask why the F he would play such a stupid prank. He continue, continues to insist we've never had one, let alone talked about getting one. And this goes on for several minutes. I'm approaching hysterics, telling him to quit playing with me when he finally says, now you know how I feel about that TV. We didn't speak about it for a long time. Then after I found this thread, brought it up and perhaps and brought up the theory that perhaps in another timeline or dimension or whatever you want to call it, we both actually died and we reset like a video game and the TV and, ex and, ex and extinguisher are glitches. I don't know if I agree with him. All I know is that I've never been so rattled in my whole life. And every time I get something out of the closet, I'm overwhelmed with this feeling of wrongness. I know it should be there, but somehow it's just not. I can't explain it. He says he's willing, he, he will go to his grave swearing that I had a tube TV. Anthony Goodley thinks that these Mandela effects are timelines crossing over. The multiverse is real. Could be. Could be. I mean, you know, you when you go through this this sub, then the sub is glitch in the matrix, which is it's really interesting. And I'm, I, you know, I'm pulling, I'm pulling the ones that I thought were fun. Most of them are are not. A lot of them just feel fake. But um, and even a couple of ones that I pulled are like, ah, they're a stretch. But there are a few like this one. Just there, it, it just it, there was a, it just felt sincere. It just felt kind of sincere. And there are a couple like this. Clear Adventure says Matrix much. Basuqua says glitches are the universe gaslighting. Yeah, it kind of feels like that. Blackbeard says this is real. Bell thinks CERN is up to no good. Kieran simulation theory. Yeah, it could be the glitches in the sim. And this is the this this one is just um, sort of that that the theme that that you see a lot here. She says, "I have four kids. I know I have four kids, but recently I just feel like there should be another one, but it's missing. When we go out, I head count and get flustered because I can't find the extra one. I have to consciously remind myself there are only four, but my heart just doesn't believe it. Well, I just put it down as one of those weird feelings and push it aside. Then." My parents sent money to my kids. They sent $500. I called them and asked why they put in so much, and they were confused. They said they told me they were sending $100 per kid. Then I reminded them I only have four kids. 
They were silent for a moment and then just kind of laughed and said they must be getting old because they were thinking there was five. Then tonight, my daughter walked into the lounge room. She looked around and said, I know we're all here, but our family feels small. My son agreed. I hadn't said anything to anyone about my feelings lately because they already think I'm ancient and forgetful at 40. Thanks for reading if you made it this far. Does anyone else ever have these feelings? This, this is what I kind of feel with deja vu, which I, which at my age you're not supposed to get as often as I do, but I do, and it's uncomfortable. And when I get deja vu, it lasts a long time. It lasts a, it lasts a, a really long time. Like you get that feeling, like, oh, deja vu. And with me, it's like, oh, deja vu. And then it goes on and on until I almost feel like I'm going kind of crazy. And then I start to get stressed out and frustrated. Like, okay, I got it. Enough with the deja vu. And I think that there could be a similar type of phenomena happening here where deja vu could be something going on with the simulation or the matrix or the universes or whatever, whatever crazy thing this is. Don, uh, bon size your deja vu triggered by smells. If it is, I hadn't noticed that, noticed that before. Shania says, uh, pretty sure deja vu is a problem with your prefrontal. That would explain some things. I can think simulation theory is real. Uh, I, I, I kind of, I kind of, I'm pretty, I'm in that corner myself. I'm, I'm 90, 90%. But it's not simulation. It's something. Midget Matt says AJ's a medium. I'm not, I don't have any type of psychic anything going on. Duke Steady, AJ sniffing not. No, I just, it's just dry in here. And I kind of just need to, to clear some bats out of the cave, but the camera's on. You know, I could do this. And now no more sniffing. But look, if if you find a little baggie of Coke in my lobby, I don't know how it got here. Call the Secret Service. They'll find out who did it. Critic Hal, just pick your nose. Well, that's what I did when I turned the camera off. <laughs> Xander's got booger sugar. This group. This group. All right, I've got I've got three three or four quick matrix stories. And then we can read a near death experience if you'd like. This uh, this is only a paragraph, but I wanted I wanted to I wanted to run it past you because because uh, I want to do an episode on, on this phenomenon. So uh, my mom died 13 years ago. About four years ago, my dad was on vacation in Arizona with his girlfriend. He said he was up watching TV and then the hotel phone rang. He answered it and said it was my mom's voice saying, I'm okay. Then he said, Cass? And he said the phone was crackly. And then the voice said, tell Heather, me, that I'm okay. He said his girlfriend was confused by the phone rang. He immediately called me even though it was late and he was crying. My dad doesn't believe in the supernatural, but still to this day can't explain that call. So I, I, you know, I'd like to do an episode on, on, on this. Phantom phone calls, sometimes they're called, about people getting calls from, from dead loved ones. And not just... Like, oh, grandma, you know, grandma called and then I find out that she died that morning. Not that, although that happens plenty. Stories like this, where the woman has been dead for 13 years and the call just comes out of the blue at a hotel. So I see that story over and over and over where you, you're living in a different house, a different country, and the dead loved one finds you. And it's always, the phone call is always the same. It's staticky, it's crackly, it's hard to understand. The voice, I know it's them, but it sounds flat, like there's no emotion. And, this, and it's always similar things, is I'm sorry, or I'm okay. You know, 
don't be sad for me. It's always that same type of thing, a kind of a reassuring story. But the reason I want to do an episode on it, not just because that's fun, is because there are at least two that I found, and if I research it, I'll find more, of these calls recorded. And one of the one of the calls that's recorded is um is from a paranormal researcher calling his partner, which is super creepy. Super creepy. Now, Rhiannon says, please do the phantom phone calls. I'll, I will do that. You know, remember not, not a few years ago that that guy died on the in a train crash. It was up in uh, in Southern California. And his phone was just calling his loved ones. He didn't say anything. It's just he he was ca he called his wife. He called parents. I called his brother. And. Um, but he was killed on impact. And his phone was destroyed. There was no way it could make these phone calls. 